Welcome, everyone. I'm the founder of QuidRoom, the social platform where accredited investors and investment professionals globally find each other. Before we kickstart, for all the investors who are listening in to the session and the podcast, if any of your questions are unanswered or to attend future investor meetups, you can join hundreds of other investors in my personal community and quit room. The invitation link is posted in here. So today we have William Ma, an active investor in the public markets of China. Coming back to our Ask an Investor live session. Hi, William. How are you doing? Hi, Pravin. I'm doing very well. You know, traveling around China. You know, good to, you know, leave from the lockdown Shanghai last time. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's how we spoke last time. And I could see that your uh, your background is different. And in, interestingly, your your background is quite unusual for whenever we meet. It doesn't seem like your boardroom. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I'm traveling, you know, seeing clients in Ningbo right now and actually in the in the laboratory, you know, on the ground, you know, uh, research track. Actually, some of the equip, equipment, medical equipment maker, you know, they are piling up infantry. So I think the demand uh -huh. from the Europe has been, you know, going down. There is one point to note, you know, for fundamental investor. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Anyways, um, so so William, just to um, let me just do this so that I can give a bit of a background for the listeners. So last time we already had a chat about why why China is the best uh, global inflation hedge, where you had shared your thoughts from an earnings perspective, from a correlation perspective, and also from a diversification perspective. So we also spoke about politics and its future impact on the markets as well. Now, for the listeners who, who missed out on the previous session, uh, I would recommend them to listen to the recording in our podcast page. The link will be posted here as well. So today, William, what we're going to do is we will be answering questions specifically in regards to China A shares, mm. uh, the effect of and, 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 and look a little bit on the volatility aspect of things, trading strategies, as well as also the impact of the political environment on China A shares. Yeah. So let's start off with uh, with the most interesting question first. Um, do you think the current political environment in China is going to be complementary for investors who are inclined towards constructing an A share portfolio in 2022? Mm -hmm. I think the visibility is getting higher. You know, when you talk to global and local investor. You know, um, some of them are actually telling me, William, you know, what is the political situation and when, you know, we should wait until. And most answer, you know, people get, you know, speaking to the so-called political expert or investment expert is October. Everyone is, you know, watching and see until the October, you know, final election is being done. But from my perspective, actually, you know, some of the domestic investors or people who kind of like follow the history very closely, the August, uh, event is even more indicative and more important to watch out for and and um, and let me explain why you know for every mm -hmm. five year you know the portfolio which is the senior executive of the Chinese government is being re-elected you know kind of like the president and then every year uh, every five year they would gather in a place called Bei Dai He and then they will decide you know who would be inside those very senior executive member in the a portfolio and then the number of member this year there are rumor and people talk about that the total number of council will be increased from seven people to nine people the possibility is not very high our expectation is over 80 percent of the possibility is still seven people but in case you know it increased from seven people to nine people that means there will be more new member and there will be more kind of like discussion must to be needed so i think for investor you know closely monitoring the china political environment the end of you know july early august where the result of the Beidai he meeting is very indicative if we have light like seven member portfolio member i think you know between you know um august to october uh, a lot of new policy be, will be being rolled out we don't need to wait until the October event. So this is from the political side. I think the catalyst or the watch out signal is earlier than many people thought. We need August, not October. Okay. So um, indirectly, uh, William, are you are you recommending that investors should wait until the event gets over? No, I think um, actually a lot of that is already kind of like reflected and priced in. 
I think 80% of the possibility is already seven member, hence the market kind of like recovery. The closer to the August event, I think the higher the clarity it is. So I think for investor waiting for October event, they don't have to wait until October. I would recommend they can kind of like participate the current rebound because I think the current rebound has been very strong and there will be some uh, positive, you know, um, high, high frequency data in June and July as well. So if that is happening, I think that will power up the equity market. So my view is you can start your position right now and wait you know for the second leg is at the end of july and then a further deploy and no need to wait for the october event uh, absolutely so um so the august event is is what we need uh, let's focus a little bit more on that right because it seems like it is definitely going to have a, an impact but obviously 80 percent if it is going to be seven members and you can take the risk about investing in the markets according to that uh, uh, that consideration that there is going to be a 20 percent risk that there okay. might be changes however um what what is going to be very important to understand is uh, the the impact of the of the chinese government and the the meeting as well as also the election in equity markets and specifically in terms of sectoral impact mm -hmm. as well where do you feel uh, the majority of the changes are going to happen after mm. these after the meeting and elections happen this time around? Yes, I think we are expecting a big uh, stimulus infrastructure package. If you look at you know when the policy start turning more open and positive is actually in mid March, when the COVID you know situation in Shanghai is getting. Uh, uh, worse, as well as some of the economic figure, you know, coming out. But in the first phase of the easing, actually, a lot of it is monetary easing, you know, rate cut, liquidity, and also less control on the real estate sector. I believe monetary part is being done. The second is regulations, if you recall, Pravin, is actually the Chinese government has announce a more friendly you know, policy towards the internet platform company. That's why the tech sector got a good rebound in the last a month or two. And then there are also policy in the new uh, pension fund system, like 401k, you know, the China uh, version of the pension system. And then there are also more policy in supporting the, uh, the mid and small cap. And then yesterday, there are also more policy in um, opening up the country to global traveler. For example, uh, historically, during the COVID, you need 14 plus 7, 14 days, you know, uh, isolation plus 7 days, you know, kind of like quarantine, total 21 days. But yesterday is being, you know, uh, announced that it is shortened to 7 plus 3. So this policy is supporting the uh, uh, entertainment, the travel and the hotel industry. So those impact will be filtered to the economy in the next a month or two. I think the missing puzzle, the missing link, if you like, is a huge infrastructure project saying that they will spend two trillion, three trillion renminbi on those eye-catching, you know, kind of like infrastructure project in China. And I believe those will only be announced in August after the, you know, uh, uh, um, the committee confirmation that I mentioned. Okay. All right. Um, and 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 you uh, strongly feel that these are long term changes and not short term uh, changes that are being implemented just before elections. Yes, those are long term changes. I think we have to go back to the you know one of the leader in China province is called Deng Xiaoping, and mm -hmm. um, he has a, a a few you know management philosophy that is being implemented by the Chinese you know government as well as a lot of you know corporate people in China. And some of them, you know, are, are very insightful and that explain at least guide me to the long term policy of the Chinese government. They said, you know, Mr. Deng Xiaoping mentioned that managing a country is kind of like using a cooking pan to pan fry many, many small fishes. Hmm. So if you turn the fishes too frequently, the small fishes, they will dissolve, they will become, you know, a mess. You should only turn the fishes when one side is cooked and then to the other side. So in Chinese, they call it managing a country, you cannot change your policy direction, flip flop just like that. So that's why you see a lot of policy is three to five years kind of like time horizon. That's a wise saying and aptly put, uh, William. And now, uh, now I'm going to go a little bit more around, around the policy uh, part of things, right? So, um, 
so so what are the what are the so we we looked into what are the positive things that are going to happen uh we also looked into the uh into the election risk a little bit here but what are the other uh risks that investors should consider at this point of time if they're going to take more of an exposure into china a shares yes i think there are two key risks that i suggest investor to monitor you know one is the debt level of the local government should the huge infrastructure project you know being announced later on this year i think the local government you know uh, um, need to issue more bonds if you like so right now i don't think um, there is a lot of discussion on the local government debt at least not on the international level i believe you know down the road the next year the next year after you know whether the local government tax they can support those local government bond would be a key risk you know to be watch out you know for investor i think the risk on real estate sector is gone you know it's being controlled and then the bubble is being kind of like contained so the next credit risk if there is one is to watch the local government bond the second point is the RMP volatility I believe you know RMB has been strengthened you know quite a bit you know in the last two three months and then going down. Um, I believe you know um, there is a potential pressure on further you know RMB depreciation if you know US dollar strengthening. So for global investor, if they are investing in the domestic China market, I think they have to perhaps consider hedge part of the RMB currency movement. You know so that you know um, in real terms they can you know kind of like get benefited as well. And and uh, you mentioned that the real estate risk is gone. From what I understand, there are, there are quite a bit of uh, distressed assets right now uh, in the real estate market in in China, right? So, so how how would an investor be able to apply uh, counter cyclical strategies um, uh, such as real estate residential distressed investments um, at this time yep. uh, in, in in the right manner? Yeah, it's a very interesting area and strategy to be deployed right now in China, because you know we are seeing policy reform. For example, some of the you know real asset, you know, you go to the court, you, you get processed, you can repatriate, you know, you know, secure the the, the property uh, very quickly and very efficient. I think that enhanced the the efficiency of this system uh, strategy. Number two is is counter cyclical by nature. Given the economy slowdown last year and this year, we are seeing some mid cap owners. They are, they are, you know, houses pledged to the bank. They are being collected by the bank. And then the bank are selling those, you know, uh, pledged real estate, you know, home equity to the AMC asset management company uh, in China. And those, you know, big four AMC, they're actually selling those, you know, real estate, high quality real estate at the discount to the market. So the discount we are talking about is between 70 to 80%. And then um, if you do a senior subordinate kind of light trenches, you know, portfolio, actually, you know, for, for the non-equity related change, you can get 7.5 to 9.5% return for a de facto 5-0, 50% loan to value on a tier one Beijing and Shanghai kind of like real estate. I don't think Beijing, Shanghai real estate, uh, commercial, a uh, residential real estate market has a downward pressure. I would say they are quite, you know, stable. For this type of risk reward, I, I believe this is a good counter cyclical strategy to be deployed in. And in the long run, it's inflation sensitive. So Chinese investors, Chinese people like tier one residential, you know, houses anyway. Interesting. Now, now getting a bit more technical around China Asia. So what are what are the black swan and volatility uh, trading strategies in China Asia right now that yes. can be applied? Yes, I believe, you know, the volatility would continue to be high, not just because of the China economy recovering. I think people are getting positive if there are more short term number coming out, there will be a kind of like an upside. But however, we have to be, you know, cautious of global, you know, uh, kind of like risk of sentiment as well. You know, I think the US, US uh, Europe market uh, is, is getting volatile, it's, it's especially, you know, also on the Ukraine situation and oil price. So I believe we are seeing opportunity in a black swan strategy in China. It's a volatility trading approach strategy. 
Historically, this uh, strategy was very profitable in global vol vol volatile times, for example, in Asian financial crisis, you know, or global financial crisis in, you know, um, 97 and 08. We are seeing this type of volatility trading being implemented in the China market is because the availability of the tools. In China, there is a ELN, equity link look product called Snowball. It's not the Snowball province that you go and drink you know, in a bar, but it's a product that sell by the domestic uh, uh, investment bank and broker to the retail investor. The selling you know, um, put option to the retail investor. I mean, sorry, the retail investor are buying put option type of structure, you know, from, from the investment bank and brokers, kind of like what is very uh, popular, you know, in the Asian, you know, private bank market in 07. We are seeing hedge fund manager going to the brokers to collect this type of cheap volatility, cheap options, you know, from the investment uh, bank, and then uh, use a hedge fund trading strategy to package it. And some of the strategy, if you put it in the right rate, they can give you, you know, 50 to 100% return, you know, should the volatility you know, pick up dramatically. So we are seeing this type of niche volatility or black swan strategy in China. Right now, the capacity is not huge because, you know, there are few player in playing that. But I think down the road, you know, uh, when retail investor participate pay more, when the, you know, retail broker investment bank, they're selling more outside, this strategy could be a uh, very interesting and meaningful for global investor to hedge part of their kind of like long only exposure in China. And, and right now, how are global investors, uh, I mean, are global investors accessing it or is it mainly domestic investors who are right. tapping into right this? Right now it's mostly domestic hedge fund, you know, domestic hedge fund participating in it. We mm -hmm. are seeing some global hedge fund set up movie in China and apply local fund management license in China. And then they are taping into this market. And um, actually, there are already channel in doing that, but I think investor didn't notice that they can also use the QFII, Q, mm -hmm. you know, quota globally to set up a Cayman fund and then investing in domestic China hedge fund. They can also use, you know, this channel to tape into it. I think it's, uh, uh, it's not about accessibility. It's about not people talk about it. They don't realize in China, you just don't not have to do long only you can also do alpha strategy you can also do counter cyclical strategy right now you can even do distress and you can do volatility trading strategy very interesting and and um, you would recommend that when it comes to high net worth individuals and other smaller investors uh, in the market as well you would usually recommend that they they uh, align with a domestic hedge fund or in or a foreign hedge fund who already is is accessing the strategy i see yeah, exactly. I think the domestic hedge fund from our research every year, they're outperforming the global hedge fund investing in the China market by five to eight okay. percent. And um, that's why I think for global investor, if they can find the right partner and right channel using QFII to investing in the domestic hedge fund directly is more kind of like profitable from my perspective. All right. OK, great. Now, I want to. Uh, um talk about whatever you would be able to talk about publicly about what is there in your portfolio, because that is always interesting for people to know, you know, uh, considering that you're one of the top investors <laughs> in China that I know. So it's, it's, oh, I, I'm, I'm very curious myself. <laughs> sure, sure. I think um, we are quite fortunate, you know, at the end of last year, you know, when, when people are, are quite excited about long China, I think we have reduced, you know, some of the exposure on the equity side, and we are starting to look at strategy that, uh, create counter cyclical, you know, strategy in the long run. And the three area, you know, uh, we add exposure, you know, late last year, early this year is macro, you know, China macro strategy. The second is China CTA, commodity, commodity trading advisor strategy. And then the third area we add exposure is a Chinese convertible bond strategy. So those strategy has been performing quite well year to day, you know, they're all up, you know, uh, uh, um, compared to the market, you know, down, you know, 10 to 15%. And actually starting, you know, um, about a month ago, since, you know, our talk, Trevin, you know, I've indicated that we are turning more positive because of the stimulus, because a lot of worst case, you know, are being priced in, you know, in the domestic China market. At the peak, some of the domestic consumption and some of the hot themes in China was down like 30 to 40%. So we see an opportunity to rotate out some of this cyclical strategy 
to the long only or long buys portfolio. So as of now, our equity exposure has been increased to around 60% in our portfolio. The rest 40% is those kind of like uh, um, uh, counter cyclical strategy. And within those 60%, you know, in China, right now we are we are seeing a long term theme uh, despite it's more being discussed you know globally but locally we are very excited about electric vehicle about solar energy about green energy the esg the green infrastructure the value chain of this esg or new energy theme is huge there are about you know 500 companies according to our classification um i think globally people only see about 100 of them you know in the value chain but for us we are seeing some green energy related component maker in the value chain which will benefit from the big infrastructure project and the money being deployed you know by china you know after august and secondly we are seeing some global investor if they invest in china they're also into this you know green infrastructure so i think if you ask me Pravin, the highest conviction for me in china besides the alternative investment strategy besides the distress besides the volatility trading i would say green infrastructure green energy electric vehicle supply chain and look for the mid and small cap in those areas don't just look for the largest battery manufacturer which you know i think you would be investing as, as well but some of the mid cap yeah. in the value chain you know they are the that horse, the black horse that is going to be bought up by the market in the next two, three quarters. So, so William, uh, that's that's a very interesting topic that you uh, brought up because uh, I just a few weeks ago, um, I interviewed uh, another gentleman who has around two and uh, more than two billion dollars uh, in AUM and then does very active investment into the electric vehicle uh, market space. Right. Yeah. So. So there was this one challenge that I've, that I personally felt, which is there are not many electric vehicle focused companies that are properly established and and have a product like how, what Tesla currently has. Yep. yep. The second is it's an interesting topic that you brought up because, um, uh, for example, if we are just focusing on only on electric vehicle, so electric vehicles are completely driven with uh, they they need a lot of cameras to operate and yep, exactly. most of the data goes back. Exactly. Uh, and one of them is well. in Hong Kong, the largest one actually. Exactly. So for the for example for the for the political event that is happening in China, there has been a ban for Tesla cars in there, right? Uh, for example. Yeah. So these are interesting things to see exactly what is going to be the future of of these electric vehicles. One, yep. uh, other than Tesla, which is already established. Yep. Um, and second, um, I assume that majority of the companies that you are doing research on uh, in green infra yep. are public companies. Yep. Is they are. public is 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 public market not? Uh, is it that big in the in in the industry right now? Because I personally feel that majority of the companies that are doing well right now are private. Yep. So these are the two concerns that I have around that market. But give, please do give me a perspective yeah, around course. how China think, works. Yeah, I think on the EV side, actually, um, uh, global investor is only looking at part of the picture. They are mostly focused on the one that listed in Hong Kong or some of the ADL, they are the car manufacturer. I think those are obvious target, but to my perspective, the value add in doing stock pick in those are quite hard because a lot of information is being priced in. So basically you are kind of like long a theme or long a ETF. But for us, you know, active managers should look at the undercover uh, manufacturer, the component manufacturer, you know, within the value chain. I, I think the camera module that you mentioned is one of the obvious target. The one that I'm talking about is some of the, for example, the electric car charger producer. For example, some of the motor manufacturer in China, which is, you know, uh, um, being kind of like, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, being um, the main component source for those electric vehicle, you know, producer. So those might not be the household name, and also those might not be the pure play because they also produce things for other kind of like industry. But as the EV market in China and global grow, this business unit will be repriced. 
So those are the dark horse that I'm talking about. And this is very common in, uh, in Japan and in uh, Korea in the 80s and 90s, right? So you have, you know, one big company, but, you know, certain component is benefiting from one subsector. And all of a sudden, people realize, oh, you are the largest maker of this sub subcomponent. And then we got a re-rating story. So this re-rating story required bottom-up research uh, fund manager is the 500 companies is uh, that I'm talking about. It's not the 100 that is on the usual suspect list on everyone's you know radar screen. And then second is on green infrastructure. I think we are talking about similar things. If you like, you know, we got wind, we got turbine, we got solar panel, solar panel manufacturer. But if you look at the supply chain of green infrastructure, it's even broader. You let you got the electric wire, uh, electric wire manufacturer, which they are telling us that going forward, their sector supplying to the green energy will be double or quadruple you know in the next year or two if the big infrastructure project is coming in so there will be a re-rating of this type of manufacturing component maker by the market and those are the true alpha from my perspective by instead of just buying you know etf or index fund on the big household name you know many people are buying right now interesting Thanks, uh, thanks uh, William for that now uh, we are almost out of time so I'm I'm just going to um, ask a, conclu uh, a conclusion question um, from my end. So what are the top two tips that you would provide to investors who are right now thinking about increasing their exposure into China A shares? Yeah, the first tip is, you know, think short term and then act. Uh, think long term and then act short term. So we think about the long-term growth story, but I think you should start deploying right now instead of waiting until October. I think the August event is important and I think the market is, is picking up. And then the second is, you know, um, be local, meaning that besides go to the mainstream electric vehicle and the new energy theme, go to the active, you know, fund manager, stock picker, who can get the re-rating story because the risk reward in that part is um, very high. You know, you pick the market and sector right, and then you know we we pick you you pick the right subcomponent. You know, alpha opportunity right. Both will you know um, give you a very good entry point. I think people are skeptical and bearish about China. Now is a good time to do a re-rating story. That's great and aptly put, William. Uh, well, that's it for now. It was great to host you again today. So let's make investment better by the day. For now, let's say goodbye. Thank you so much. Happy investing. I'll go back to the factory. <laughs> Enjoy the blue hat. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.